Hi everyone, I'm Lorraine Ald, and thank you for attending. In this session, I'll be talking about higher assurance identity proofing in accordance with NIST digital identity guidelines. Through the use of these guidelines, I will provide you with the tools to give you greater confidence that the applicant truly is who they claim to be. Now, I know we're in a virtual environment today, but I will be there um, through chat. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to shoot a, a question and I'll be there to answer. So this is the agenda um, for today. I'll be speaking to you for about 35 minutes or so uh, regarding what's driving the need for higher assurance identity proofing. What exactly do I mean by identity proofing um, for in, yeah, in accordance with NIST Special Pub 863? And then I'll go over some of the techniques and technologies to identify fraud and then wrap up with some guidance. So remote work has exploded during the pandemic, up to 18 times more remote work now than what has been done in the past. This pandemic has truly changed how we do business today. What was once done in person is now done remotely. Technology and executives aren't driving these changes. It's really COVID-19 that has transformed telework. With everyone working from home and no longer coming into the office, or going in person to the, their local bank, what confidence do I have that you are who you claim to be? So fraudsters are also working from home. They are no longer working from nine to five. With more people working remotely, fraudsters will have many more points of entry to attack your organization or your service. But it's not just in the workplace where fraud is taking place. This chart, shows that fraudsters are targeting those facing hardships, especially those out of work who need that unemployment or that stimulus check or tax refund. As an example, coronavirus era unemployment insurance fraud was first identified in Washington state in May of last year and has since spread to all 50 states. So now that we've laid out the drivers, let's shift and talk about what exactly do I mean by higher assurance identity proofing and why it's so important in a COVID-19 world to help combat identity fraud. So why is identity proofing needed? So traditional identity proofing was performed using static knowledge-based authentication as a means to establish trust in a digital identity. Questions such as, what is your mother's name was deemed satisfactory in establishing that trust. However, with the rise in data breaches, what once was a secret has now been stolen. So new approaches are needed in establishing that trust in a digital identity to ascertain that you truly are you. This trust is key in providing a foundation for all future interactions where I have confidence that the digital identity as being presented truly belongs to your real life subject. So there are numerous situations where you cannot be a dog on the internet and need to reliably establish an association of the digital identity with a real life subject. There are also situations where the association is required to establish accountability for high risk actions, such as changing the release rate of water from a dam or transferring $50 million to a bank account. Identity proofing establishes that a person is who they say they are based on the validity of one or more pieces of identity evidence. The more due diligence incorporated into the identity proofing process, the higher the confidence that the applicant is who they claim to be. For example, one would place little confidence on self-asserted identity. I say I'm Sally Jones, therefore I am Sally Jones. However, if I claim to be Cindy Doe and can provide written and corroborated identity evidence proving I truly am Cindy Joe. there is much higher confidence placed in that identity. Now, if I provide all that documentation to a credential service provider, you can be pretty sure I am who I claim to be. So identity proofing is thought to be done once at the time of enrollment or registration, but that may not be the only case, it may be required 
at various stages of the digital identity life cycle where life events warrant it. So think in the physical realm. I get identity proof periodically for renewal of my driver's license or renewal of TSA's global entry or pre-check. Same thing applies in the digital realm. For example, I may initially have been identity proof at a lower assurance level, but based on required access to higher risk transactions, I may be asked to be identity proof at a much higher level of assurance. Or in times of emergency or transactions between strangers, one may need to be identity proof to ensure that that digital identity still belongs to that real life person who was initially identity proofed at enrollment. Or in the context of progressive proofing, my account was initially created based on minimal proofing and as new privileges or roles are assigned to me, I may be subjected to additional identity proofing. So in 2017, NIST released an update to Special Pub 863, um, the Digital Identity Guidelines. Uh, this four volume set provides an overview of general identity frameworks that use digital identities, authenticators, and assertions together in a digital system. One of these volumes, 63A, is solely dedicated to enrollment and identity proofing. And I want to mention that these guidelines are not solely meant for government agencies, but can also benefit commercial industry where higher assurance needs are required. So let's talk a bit more about 863A, the identity proofing enrollment um, document. So NIST describes the process regarding how applicants could prove their identities and then become enrolled as a valid subscriber within an identity system. The document also provides requirements for applicants going through the identity proofing for both in-person and remote scenarios at three different identity assurance levels, ranging from the lowest level of assurance to the highest level of assurance. Um, identity assurance level one is the lowest level and it essentially is self-asserted that these attributes are neither validated nor verified. I am Sally Jones, therefore I am Sally Jones. Identity assurance level two essentially states that some sort of uh, remote or in-person identity proofing is required. For this level, the applicant typically uses their own equipment to perform the remote proofing. At the highest level, IAL3, requires some sort of physical presence either in person or via a supervised remote. Supervised remote means that there is a person physically present during the entire identity proofing process, typically at a kiosk in controlled spaces overseeing the entire proofing process. At the other end is a trained operator utilizing a webcam, for example, who can remotely supervise the entire identity proofing process from the time that you, you arrive to the time that you complete the entire process. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them in chat. So how does one determine exactly what identity assurance level to pick? Well, NIST developed a decision tree to help organizations select the appropriate identity assurance level. This decision tree uses the results of a credential service provider's risk assessment of the digital services offered to provide the assurance level pro provided by the identity proofing process. The risk assessment determines the extent to which risks must be mitigated by the identity proofing process. So I'm gonna walk through this decision tree real quickly. So for step one, the organization will first need to ask if whether they have any personal information Collect it. If no, you are at IAL1 and can stop the process. Otherwise, you proceed to step two. Step two determines if any of the personal information needs to be validated and verified or if self-asserted attributes are acceptable. If any of the personal information needs to be validated and verified, you proceed to step three. Otherwise, you are at IAL1. If an organization actually makes it to step three, it means that some sort of higher assurance identity proofing is required. Step three is intended to look at the potential impacts of an identity proofing failure 
to determine if IAL2 or IAL3 is the most appropriate selection. If any of the questions are in step three is at high risk, then you are at IAL3. If not, you proceed to step four. So step four asks the question regarding whether the personal information required by an organization will ultimately resolve to a unique identity. If yes, the process could stop here at IAL2, but the organization should consider if steps five and six are of value to them, where the acceptance of claims will reduce exposure to the risk of overcollecting and storing more personal information is necessary. A federated environment is a great example of receiving claims as the service provider is not in control of the attribute information. If an organization deems that a federated attribute approach is acceptable, a similar decision tree is available in 863.3 to determine which federation assurance level to use. So once an identity assurance level is determined, the credential service provider can follow a general process flow to implement the required identity proofing identity assurance level. So NIST defines three steps for the enrollment and identity proofing process, resolution, validation, and verification. So resolution uniquely distinguishes an individual from all other people using a minimal set of core attributes or PII. This is the only step that the credential service provider may use knowledge-based verification. Note that it's extremely important to use dynamic out-of-wallet knowledge-based verification sets of questions such as, what was your last mortgage payment? Or what is the amount of your auto loan? So step two is validation of your physical identity evidence that is collected or captured. Examples of identity evidence are a driver's license, a passport, or a bank statement. For example, when one goes to the Department of Motor Vehicles for their driver's license, the applicant must provide an unexpired picture ID, proof of residence, and perhaps additional support documentation to the clerk. The clerk looks to see if there's any evidence of tampering as well as look at the information contained on the identity documents. In the digital world, this is essentially what is performed during the validation stage. The identity information is presented in a digital form is validated against authoritative sources to ensure that the identity evidence is genuine, authentic, it contains information that is correct, and then it contains information that pertains to a real life subject. Once the identity evidence has been validated, the last step is verification. This step verifies the applicant to the claimed identity. Going back to the DMV example, after the clerk reviews the presented identity evidence, the clerk will determine whether the individual standing in front of them is indeed the individual on the picture ID. In remote proofing, this is accomplished by matching the identity evidence via a biometric check, such as by the applicant taking and uploading a selfie picture of themselves to the credential service provider. Liveness detection and other fraud detection checks are performed to ensure that the image is of a real person. Lastly, the credential service provider issues an enrollment code either via a mobile phone or through the postal service to confirm address of record through verification of the address contained on the supplied valid piece of identity evidence. Once all of these steps are successfully completed, a digital identity is created. So let's walk through an example of what the identity proofing process would look like. So we, for this example, we'll assume that we're using IAL2 remote proofing. For a resolution to a unique identity, the credential service provider will need to collect minimal PII from the applicant, such as their full name, date of birth, full mailing address, and phone number. In addition, the credential service provider needs to collect identity evidence. NIST offers specific requirements for strength of identity evidence required for each of the identity assurance levels. In this example, the credential service provider provides one form of strong identity evidence, such as a driver's license, and two fair pieces of identity evidence, such as a utility bill and bank statement. Uh, NIST released an implementation guidance last July where examples of identity evidence are provided. And I'll revisit the implementation guidance later in this presentation. 
Once the identity evidence is collected, the credential service provider validates the core attributes against authoritative sources such as credit bureaus or AMVA for driver's license information to ensure the information is both accurate and belongs to a real life subject. Forensics, forensics checks are performed against the identity evidence to ensure that the documents are genuine. These checks include checking the font, the color, and watermarks. Once the identity evidence is validated, the credential service provider needs to establish a linkage between the claimed identity and the applicant providing the evidence. Verification typically is done by matching the strongest piece of identity evidence via a selfie. Once the credential service provider is satisfied with the selfie match to the identity evidence, the credential service provider sends an enrollment code to the validated phone number. So now that I've walked through a high level overview of NIST higher assurance identity proofing guidelines, let's now focus on answering the question, why is it so hard to do? And by doing that, we'll provide a use case of a NIST conformant credential service provider detecting fraud and then walk through some of the techniques and technologies that are used to help detect fraud. So remember that slide back earlier in the presentation where we talked about identity theft and the vast amounts of data stolen about an individual. <clears throat> this data is readily available to purchase on the dark web by fraudsters to then obtain access to your bank account, receive your stimulus check or your tax returns. It is due to this high increase in stolen identities where organizations are finding that they no longer trust that digital identity. For example, these fraudsters are targeting unemployment insurance benefits and stimulus checks using stolen credentials to apply for unemployment benefits through state websites. This is a key reason why higher assurance identity proofing can help provide confidence that you are who you claim to be. So how can identity proofing help identify and defeat fraud? The following slides will first introduce credential service providers who offer this higher assurance identity proofing and then provide an example of how the higher assurance identity proofing can detect and prevent fraud. So there are currently two full service credential service providers who have either completed or are currently going through IAL2 certification by the Kantara Initiative. Kantara is a nonprofit who provides third-party assessment for NIST Special Pub 863 Revision 3 based on their conformance criteria. The first credential service provider, IDME, has been certified by Kantara at IAL2 and offers both remote and virtual in-person identity proof and via webcam to assist those applicants who need additional help through the identity proofing process. The second is U.S. Government Services Administration's citizen-facing login.gov. Login.gov is currently being certified for IA2 and offers remote identity proofing services for citizens wishing to do business with some agencies. These two credential service providers offer high assurance remote identity proofing and strong authentication um, in accordance with NIST Special Pub 863-3 guidelines. Since the start of the pandemic, requests for their remote proofing services have increased. So the need for unemployment insurance benefits is one area that has certainly increased since COVID. Given that the unemployment insurance program allows claims to be filed online, this certainly presents an opportunity for fraudulent filings. The CARES Act presented an opportunity for fraudsters as well as scam rings as noted on the slide. In fact, the US Labor Department reported fraudsters were able to steal billions of dollars in fraudulent unemployment payments since the U from the US last November. One of the reasons is that the state unemployment insurance offices are working with decades old technology that cannot keep up with the fraudsters who have bypassed identity safeguards by using stolen and fake identities. So instead of battling with the decades old technology, 20 states have selected IDME to provide identity verification services in accordance with the NIST guidelines for those individuals requesting those unemployment debt benefits. The numbers you see here on the slide are how those individuals were verified. 
90% pass through a completely online remote proofing experience and 10% uh, required additional assistance via a video, video call with a trained IDME representative. Since the end of January of this year, IDME has blocked over 800,000 fraudulent claims. So these are the types of fraud that were detected during the identity verification for the unemployment benefit payment. While these percentages listed are based on the numbers of fraudulent claims for this particular use case, the types of fraud listed here can be applied to many use cases. So how do credential service providers following NIST 863 detect and prevent these types of fraud? How can I be confident that the individual at the other end of the device is who they claim to be? The following slides will cover the types of fraud seen in the identity proofing process, as well as best practices to help detect and prevent fraud following the NIST guidelines. So knowledge-based verification has historically been used and continues to be used to verify claimed identity by testing the knowledge of the applicant against information obtained from public databases. However, RPII has been stolen from data breaches, which truly defeats the purpose of using KBV to verify an applicant. We therefore must limit the use of static uh, knowledge-based verification as much as possible. Answers to static questions are easy to find. For example, all one has to do is look at social media to find one's mother's maiden name, date of birth, and most likely names of family members and names of pets. In addition, many are now posting pictures of their COVID vaccine cards on social media. Please do not do that. It lists important PII beyond just the, your name and date of birth, including the vaccine type and the lot number. If one must use KBV, limit its use and make those questions as dynamic as possible, as well as basing the questions from multiple authoritative sources and not just from financial or credit bureaus. So synthetic identity fraud combines real information such as one's social security number with false information like a fake name to create a new identity. This type of fraud is typically financially driven and those who create these synthetic identities will spend months cultivating their identities and building up lines of credit. These fraudsters frequently target individuals who are less likely to check their credit information often, such as children, the elderly, or even homeless people. So how does one combat I synthetic identity? The number one thing to do is query authoritative sources such as the credit bureaus, uh, AMFA for the DMV, as well as see if the social security number being presented is on the master death file. Some examples that may be that one may be dealing with a synthetic identity include, is there an ability or inability to match and or verify an identity across all PII attributes provided by the applicant? Or are there multiple identities associated with the same social security number or check for multiple accounts originating from the same IP address? User behavior can also help detect patterns and anomalies that indicate potentially fraudulent behavior. For example, user behavior could be used to determine if the identity is stolen or synthetic based on how familiar the applicant is with filling out the data on the form. For example, does the individual pause entering PII that the true person should know about, or are they using control keys to fill out the form? So let's talk briefly about identity evidence. For this step, the applicant will take pictures of the front and back of their identity evidence, such so as a driver's license and passport and submit that information to the credential service provider. The type of identity evidence required depends on the strength of evidence required by the credential service provider. So I like to use the example of going to the Department of Motor Vehicles to receive your driver's license. The type of documentation required varies with the type of driver's license received. If you get a real ID, you're required to provide additional forms of identity evidence than you would for a traditional driver's license. That clerk at the DMV is also trained to detect altered identity evidence. The same applies in the context of remote proofing. The higher the identity assurance required, the stronger forms of documentation are required to resolve that identity. 
Forensics checks are also performed to detect the authenticity of the identity evidence provided. Some checks performed include, are the holograms in the correct location? Is the font the right size? Is the blue the, is the excuse me, is the color the right shade of blue? So take a look at the picture on the right while I speak to this slide. I'll be coming back to the photos shortly. So during the higher assurance identity proofing process, one is required to capture a biometric, usually in the form of a selfie. The selfie is then compared to the picture in the identity evidence, such as your driver's license or passport. Liveness detection helps determine that there is a live human instead of a fraudster circumventing this channel by using a mask, an altered photo, or a recording or doctored video. So a deep fake takes key characteristics of a person's appearance or voice and overlays those characteristics onto another's. These deep fakes are now starting to make an appearance to attempt to bypass the liveness detection of selfie checks. So how are they doing this? Liveness checks are performed by possibly asking the applicant to blink, smile, nod, or speak a phrase. This pattern does not vary, which makes it fairly easy to spoof by a deep fake or an animated GIF. So currently there are rudimentary deep fakes that are being discovered, but those will improve in time. So some things to consider when combating deep fakes is the selfie check is to never use the same directions for each identity proofing event. So what do I mean by that? So if I, as a credential service provider, always ask the applicant to blink, then it's fairly easy for a fraudster to use a blinking animated GIF or a deep fake. However, if I ask the applicant to turn the head to your left and then to the right and ask another applicant to smile or frown and then another applicant to read some words, it makes it much harder for a fraudster to use these techniques to defeat the liveness detection check. Use of artificial intelligence in the liveness detection will help as well. The artificial intelligence used in the liveness detection can help determine that something is not quite right, such as the, is the background embedded a static image or is a lighting off where shadows in the room doesn't affect the face. So speaking of shadows and static images, let's get back to the pictures on the right. So imagine them animated. Can you tell which one is real and which three are fake? See anything blurred or missing in any of the images? Are the reflections of the irises different? feel free to put your answer in chat. So if you picked image number three, that's the real person and you are correct. The others were computer generated and I did not get that right. So think of a fraud consortium network as a watch list in the digital realm. For example, in the real world, your identity is already checked on the do not fly list prior to checking to the airport. This do not fly list is only applicable to those who fly on commercial aircraft within, into, or out of the United States. Other countries such as Canada and Pakistan have their own form of a do not fly list. So in the digital world, organizations within industries affected by fraud often rely on consortium data as a system defense against new fraud strategies. Consortium data for fraud pre prevention is a system that shares information with a group of customers. In other words, if a fraudulent actor is known to commit fraud at one customer website, and then that individual attempts to commit the same type of fraud at a second customer website, then that attempt will be flagged as fraudulent and blocked. These fraud consortium networks pool information of known fraudulent events, sources, or IP addresses, and can be leveraged during the identity proofing process. For example, when presented with a new customer identity, an organization can ask the fraud consortium network whether the name, email address, and device identifier this new customer belongs to an identity that other members of the network trust. Other more member organizations can then respond based on their own identity proofing efforts and their own transaction histories with that customer identity. So my personal opinion is that it would be beneficial for the government and industry to partner together to create a wider fraud collaboration network. This will capture and share known fraudulent 
identities and devices on a much broader scale. So now that we have learned about higher assurance identity proofing, where do I go for guidance or best practices? So NIST released implementation resources early July of 2020. The implementation resources offer guidance to facilitate understanding and implementation of service of Special Pub 863.3, and are broken down by topic area for each of these three volumes. One of those areas um, in the 63A piece includes a list of example identity evidence, such as, as driver's license and passport and social security number and other um, items. So definitely take a look for their examples um, in that piece. Furthermore, for volume 63A, one of the areas NIST mentions is the requirement that the identity proofing enrollment processes performed is based on applicable written policy or practices statements that document all the steps taken to verify an applicant's identity. Within this section, NIST points the reader to MITRE's guidance for this area. So last year, MITRE internally funded an effort to document in the form of practice statement templates, the requirements and processes to achieve compliance with either remote identity assurance levels two and three. So I want to quickly step through what the template looks like um, that we created and published. Um, again, that these are our interpretation of documenting all the processes used in enrollment and identity proofing, as well as capturing any proofing errors as required in 863A section 42 requirement six. On the left are the steps of the identity proofing process that we've walked through earlier. For this example, I will step through what the template looks like for collection of identity evidence. In the center is an overview of what is required in the collection of identity evidence, as well as the bottom center showing examples of the types of documents required for the strength of identity evidence. On the upper right-hand corner of this slide provides a blank table to allow the credential service provider to fill in the collected identity evidence. Each column along the top of that table um, is defined below to guide the credential service provider in filling out the required information. Lastly, there is a table to capture any errors that may occur as well as what technology or process would be used to resolve that error. For example, the number of retries allowed, proofing alternatives such as going in person if remote fails, or fraud countermeasures when anomalies are detected. So NIST plans to update NIST Special Pub 863. Last year, NIST sought public comment to revision three to be taken into consideration when they work on revision four. What you see on the slide is the timeline for all the milestone activities associated with this revision. The plan is to publish revision four by third quarter of fiscal year 2022. So here are some items you can apply based on what you have learned today. So next week, you should download and start to review NIST Special Pub 863 Revision 3, uh, NIST Implementation Resources, and MITRE's Templates. These documents will help you with the development of the required identity proofing and enrollment practices statement documentation. Starting with 863 Revision 3, start following the decision tree to help determine the assurance level you are based on the amount of risk that must be mitigated by the identity proofing process. Start gathering your organization's identity proofing requirements and document them using MITRE's templates. All the uh, links provided on this slide are for the documents I just mentioned. So um, in the first three months, you should be doing your market research. While doing that market research, please keep in mind the types of fraud such as forced documents, or the risk of deep fakes and th synthetic identities. Ask the credential service providers how they mitigate these and other types of threats and fraud. Once you have made your selection a credential service provider, work with them to complete the templates to ensure that they satisfy the requirements and mitigate the identity theft and fraud you have identified. So higher assurance identity proofing can help detect and prevent fraud. 
Use as many channels and sources as possible to help render decision regarding is that applicant who they really claim to be or is in fact a fraudster. Fraud mitigation measures include inspecting the identity evidence for any forgeries, examining the device characteristics used by the applicant and evaluate behavioral characteristics of the applicant. Is the applicant using shortcuts while filling out the form or pausing to fill out a street address? Check multiple authoritative sources as well as vital statistic repositories such as the death master file. Lastly, include lifeness detection for the selfie check and ensure that randomness is used to avoid animated GIFs and deep fakes. All these techs, all these tools and technologies will help answer the question, are you really you? Thank you.